identify and book the world's best speakers for your next event. MENA Speakers is the leading speakers and MC bureau in the Middle East. We bring global talent to the region and have established the region as a key global hub for speakers. Inspire and motivate your audience. Find exactly what you are looking for by working closely with us to assist you in understanding the cost-benefit analysis tied to selecting a speaker for any event. Ensure that your audience is educated, engaged and empowered. Connect with us for a quick response and tailored advice. Book your speakers now. As leaders, we get the behaviors that we demonstrate and that we tolerate. And if we are demonstrating toxicity, well, I mean, that's that's just <laughs> on another level. But similarly, if we are tolerating toxicity, it is a poison that will spread. And you can only build a healthy culture in the face of toxicity for so long. And eventually the toxicity will take over. So again, for me, it's a both end. Focus on what's positive and possible and amplify that as much as possible. But ignore toxicity at your peril because it will take over. Good morning, good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're in. If it's Friday, you know it's the CEO series, where we bring together global leaders, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, innovators, disruptors. Our guest today is Naveen Postma, HBR and Inc. magazine contributor and CEO of NaveenPostma.com. She has a world, has a wide and varied career across multiple organizations and sector in South Africa, as well as internationally. She's a global strategy and culture consultant and an expert lecturer and facilitator on women leadership development programs. Her, her recent book, If You Don't Do Politics, Politics Will Do You, which we will discuss a little later. So I want to welcome you to the show and how are you? Thank you, Ron. I'm really well. It's Friday, you know, Friday. So even when you're self-employed, there is something that feels different about a Friday. So I'm very well, thank you. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. You know, you recently published an article. I think it was last week. How fear stopped me from betting on myself. Two things about the article. The visual that you told the story versus wording. And uh, walk us through that that fear, because we all possess that from time to time, fear, you know, uh, inner conflict. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think all credit must go to HBR for actually wanting to do something a little bit experimental. And, and so oh. my article is one of a few that they're piloting to say, can we tell stories that are firstly a little bit more personal? And second of all, can we use graphics and illustrations? Oh. And so when my editor and I spoke about this, one of the things that I thought could be really useful in this was a LinkedIn post that I wrote a few, I think a few months ago, talking about when I was first employed as a, a very, I think, um, overpaid management <laughs> consultant. And, you know, I, I was the first person in my family, I still am the first person in my family to go to university. I was getting paid a lot of money. I was getting training over in Harvard. It was really quite wonderful. And then all of a sudden, increasingly, I had this, this sense of restlessness that I couldn't yes. ignore. And I sat down and spoke. It was a complete fluke. I haven't seen him for years since. But I sat down and I spoke with a family friend of ours. And I said, you know, I'm getting a bit restless and I really wish I could start my own business. And he said to me, well, well why don't you? And I said, well, you know, I think it's about, about the security because I've got some money in the bank uh, and I've got a really nice job. And he just looked at me, and I'll never forget his expression because it was just dumbfounded. And he said, but Niven, do me a favor. Money in the bank is not security because you can lose that money. Investments can disappear. I mean, look at what's happening to Bitcoin now. Yeah. And, and even if it's not something as um, cutting edge as Bitcoin, banks can disappear. Investments can come to nothing. They could be Ponzi schemes. He says, you can lose that money tomorrow. You can lose okay. your job tomorrow. He said, if you don't have 
the understanding that the fundamental, most irreplaceable security you need to have is the security in yourself, well, then, you know, you, you've kind of lost the plot, which is not to say, let's be really clear, not to say that a good job and money in the bank don't help, but they're not security, you're security. Mm. And as I listened to that, I thought, you know, I think he's got a point. And so I resigned yeah. <laughs> uh, not very much uh, long after and then set up my first business, which I said in that article was a complete and dismal failure. <laughs> but, you know, from there, I went on to do many other much more successful things. That's absolutely amazing. So, you know, you, you think sometimes you look back and say, what if that person had not mentioned that to me? Yeah. I would have still been suffering for, you know, you see people that's in a job, they've been there 10, 15 years, and they hate every Monday morning to even face that. No, I mean, I really, I can't imagine, I can't imagine anything worse. And mm. somebody asked me the other day, so how have you planned your career? And I just started to laugh. And about five minutes later, I stopped laughing. I'm like, there was no plan here. But there was a very clear intention that, hey, there's more to life than um, kind of gr growing up, going to school, working uh -huh. for 40 years, and then hoping like crazy your pension sees you through <laughs> and it's starting to live then. No, no, no. Do me a favor. You're telling too many truths. You're telling too <laughs> many truths today. Because so many people so many people go through that. You know, last week I had a young lady on that. She's a, she was a trained architect. But she enjoyed making jewelry, and she ditched the architecture and became a became a jewelry designer. And you oh, know, and, and, yeah, because I, I love to talk to people about this transition. You know, you know, we face these crossroads. We're trying to figure out what's next, and do we do the same safe thing? Because a lot of say our parents' generation would look at you. How could you ever even think to walk away from a job that you have all the security to no. st do a startup? Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, my parents had the same conversation with me. <laughs> yes. I have, I have admittedly got somewhat unusual parents because I also backpacked for high, uh, for four years after high school. Oh. So my parents gave me a ticket. I had a rucksack, and four years later, I came back. So, you know, when when you have parents who give you the leeway and latitude to do that when you're 18, they're not your yeah. average parents. Yeah. But even so, they were quite nervous about this letting go of a job. They were, no, no, hold on to it. It's fabulous. <laughs> It's fabulous for them and that generation because they worked until 20, 30, 40 years or whatever it yes. was. And that was kind of the yes. goal. And I'm a first generation graduate, college graduate of my family. So I understand that concept. Um, and when I decided to pull, I bought a convenience store. And, and my father huh. said, you got you to walk away from IBM. To, are you nuts? I said, no, <laughs> but it's, I want to try this. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and are you nuts? Sounds even funnier in an American accent, much more um, emotive <laughs> than it does in a South African accent. So that really made me laugh. So what, what advice would you give to people that are sitting in that spot? Today is Friday. They're excited about Friday. But Sunday comes around and it's all together different. You flip it 180 degrees and now you got to deal with Sunday. I call it Sunday night angst. And mm. you have to deal with mon Monday. If you were having that conversation, how could you carry that on to? How could you carry that on to the person that you're sitting in front of this? That that decision making time. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Ron. You know, and I I am loath to give anyone advice for the one life that they have to live and answer for uh, because it is so personal and it is so yes. contextual. And I think. One of the things that gets our attention in life are the crucible experiences of life that suddenly remind us of what matters and what doesn't matter. And so yeah. I think for so many people in the world, COVID has been a crucible experience. You know, like what actually matters to me? In this one, to use the, the words of the poet Mary Oliver, Oliver, in this one sweet, wild, precious <laughs> life that I have, what matters? And, you know, there can be all kinds of things that, that are crucible experiences. A health scare where you suddenly mm -hmm. think, across the time I thought I had, maybe I don't. Losing someone very dear and close to you. And so I think the only advice I could give, and I'm glad that it's advice that I, I didn't need to take. I, I kind of made these decisions anyway. And then when I had some crucible experiences of my own, it reminded me of the things that mattered to me. The only advice mm -hmm. that I can give is for heaven's sake, don't wait for those crucible experiences yeah, yeah. to think that you've got, because, you know, the ultimate 
message from those is that you may not have all the time and the options that you think. And we can know this intellectually. Mm -hmm. but I think with a crucible experience, it suddenly hits you viscerally and you yeah. get it on an emotional level that's very mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Confucius who said, but I mean, how many things haven't been co ascribed to Confucius? So who knows who actually said <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, um, we don't care. That's not yeah, IP. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So somebody clever said it. And, and I think it's very profound. Um, and they said, you know, we all have two lives. And the second one starts the moment. But the Ooh. moment we truly understand we've only got one. Oh. And so, you know, those are things that I've... I've internalized in my life. And if they help somebody, fabulous, but far be it from me to give advice. Mm. You, you, you mentioned COVID and, and I know I saw on the news that it's approaching 1 million deaths yes. from COVID. But, but one of the key points you just mentioned, you, you, you talked about what COVID has meant to people. That time that you had a time to really sit back and reflect. And I think a lot of people are reflecting because when you talk about the great resignation and all these kinds of things, I said, that's reflection from being locked in a house for, for one month or mm. however amount of time you were in. And it causes you, forces you in a lot of cases to rethink what you're doing every day and you're hating it or you love it. Yes. Or you just haven't thought about it for a very long time. You're just in, yeah. a, in a habit, you know, kind yeah. of an unthink, unthinking, creeping non-choice that yeah. you, you never consciously made, or you may have consciously made a very long time ago and mm -hmm. never stopped to reevaluate. A friend of mine has a fabulous phrase. She talks about, yes, the wheel is turning, but the hamster is dead. Oh. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and to, to suddenly just wake up and think, but hold on a second. Um, maybe a lot is up for uh, rethinking and reevaluation. And so, I wrote a post the other day saying, look, I think the great resignation is an important topic. And certainly it's an important trend. But I mean, aren't we missing something that before the great resignation, surely there's been a great reevaluation. Yeah. And then after the great resignation, ideally there's a great reinvention, you know. Mm -hmm. So and, and great is, is a relative concept. Just to change jobs after 30 years for some people can be a great change. And and yeah. good luck and you know, well done to them. Yeah. But I think the resignation is the, 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 the thing we see. The reevaluation re and the reinvention are just as important. So you've given me confusions. Now you just gave me that. It's, do I send a check to you for using that again? <laughs> <laughs> because, because I love the wheel and the hamster. Oh my God. I mean, life goes and the, just out of it, totally out of it, and not even willing to you know, respond to that anymore. So, you know, one of the questions I want to ask you, because I, I really... Um, I really enjoyed that article. And folks, for people listening in, uh, the name of the article is How Fear Stopped Me From Betting on Myself. If you follow me, I posted that uh, two days ago, I think it was. Let's talk about what I consider a kind of a reevaluation mindset for people. We all hear that inner voice. That inner voice goes, 20, we wake up in the morning, the inner voice is there. And it's talking to us and it brings fear a lot of times. It brings confidence a lot of times and it can flip. How did you manage that inner voice when you decided to open this business, secure a job, open a business, and I failed, but I'm going to still come back and try it again. I'm not going to listen to you in a voice and I'm going to continue on. Hmm. Well, I suppose I may have given a different answer if you asked me 20 years ago, but with the benefit yeah. of hindsight and, you know, as with childbirth, the pain lessens, or so I've been told, I've never had kids. But I think for me, it was two things. The first is it was one of those things in life that I, I couldn't not do. You know, the compulsion to do it, the, the def definition of failure for me was so clearly not trying as opposed to trying and then the business didn't work. Okay. And it just, it was something I couldn't not do. Mm. And I think, interestingly, secondly, as I've gotten older and as I've done more and more on my own terms and understood more and more of the value that I bring and want to bring and the, the rules by which I want to live my life. And now, you know, as you get older, you can increasingly do that. Interestingly, Ron, the voice that I said to a friend the other day that I had to quieten is the voice of, and, and who do you think you are? And that was very interesting. 
yeah. you know, the voice of, and who do you think you are who only work so many days in the month, so many months in the year because you want to do other things? Who do you think you are to turn down work in a country like South Africa where we've got 40% unemployment? Mm. You know, who do you think you are to be able to live on these terms unapologetically when so many other people have got no work or are just dragging themselves through 40 years of working or would be desperate um, for even a fraction of what I can charge for my time? Mm. And so it's just very interesting to, to quieten that voice of you've earned this, you're worth it, you do a lot that's valuable for yourself and other people, you give away a lot freely. Um, and, and who are you needing to answer to here for the good things other than yourself? Mm. And that was a very interesting experience to realize that, that voice, not the voice of doubt and fear, but the voice yeah. of entitlement, yeah. Yeah. you know, was one that I had to quiet. Yeah. And, and see, when you, you talk about a generational concept because our parents suffered on these jobs or whatever they were doing because their end goal was to get out pension or whatever it was and mm. was beyond that. And, and I think a lot of cases, they probably were not looking for fulfillment as their kids were looking for and didn't want to follow in that footstep of just going to the job every day. And, you know, it's kind of like the movies. You see the person in, in jail and every day they mark off a day because that date has passed and they've got X amount of time to do. Yeah, no, it, I can't think of anything worse. I mean, really, my, my heart stops at <laughs> the thought. And, you know, I think I think fear cuts across generations and the things that make us scared and the things that we say are reasons but are actually excuses are not generationally dependent, mm -hmm. are not the nature of work dependent. I mean, I was talking about it just yesterday to a group um, and we were talking about the golden handcuffs that can exist in so many roles. Uh. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I can see it with some dear friends of mine. No, no, I just need to have so much in my pension plan. Yeah. Okay, well, that number came and went years ago. No, 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 no. I just need this. No, no. I just need to pay for my children's university. No, no. I just need to set them up in their first home. You know, the, those goalposts always shift and they're incredibly good reasons that you can trot out to everyone and everyone nods and says, oh, well, you're being wise and prudent. Yeah. And again, only you can know if they're a valid reason or just a, a good sounding excuse. Mm. But I look at this and I think it's been 10 years since you said you would, le would leave. What have you done? Because you've got a ton of money in that pension fund. It's yeah. not the absolute number. It's the relative lack of security and lack of willingness or ability to back yourself, you know. Mm. That's, a, that's a hell of a conversation with here because everything you just said gave tons of reasons to stay, but your inner body was saying, I need to move and, and possibly do something else to find fulfillment. And I think, I th so when I go back to the great resignation, I, and I'm kind of sick of seeing all these articles, you know, relates to it. So this is why I think that your article hit home, you know, um, betting yourself versus betting on the version of you that I'm doing everything I need to do and I hate doing it every day. So I always, one of the things I always talk to is the uh, the Monday morning mindset. If you tell people, what is TGIF? And everybody says, yay, thank God it's Friday. So what is a TGIM? Everybody in the room kind of, like, nope, don't even get it. But what you did gave you, a, gave you the TGIM. And even when you fail, you were able to bounce back. So walk us through that mindset that you failed and I've got to rethink. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So I suppose one thing to also point out is that for me, I didn't hate any of my, my roles. I mean, I think all of my roles and all of the work I've gotten to do have been profound privileges. And I mean, there really have been things that I've been delighted, grateful, um, proud to do and then I got to a point where I thought there's something else now it's time to change a friend of mine says to me oh but Niven you're like Madonna it's quite an outdated reference but you're like Madonna you reinvent yourself every three years and so you know three years in I'm like no no that was wonderful but yeah and and so where that one ended up um, after my, that business failed and then I was I was actually quite uh, scared because I was plumb out of money and plumb out of time. And then I got offered a great position. And I thought, actually, this looks like fun. Let me do that. 
And so I've had alternating experiences of running my own business, of taking on executive roles. But this final experience now of setting myself up as an independent consultant, I mean, that this pretty much feels like the last time. Um, well, the last executive <laughs> position that I had feels like yeah. the last time. I said to somebody the other day, first of all, I did this because I am never going to fill in a leave form ever again. Like, no, mm. I am not asking for permission as to what to do with my yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I am now the CEO and staff of my own company. So if you see me talking to myself, I'm having a staff meeting. <laughs> and frankly, um, you know, as lovely as it is to work for somebody else right now and for the next 20, 30 years, working for myself on my own terms is way more interesting. It's way more interesting and it's very lonely at times. It's like you always hear people with these pipe dreams. Oh, I want to own my own business. I said, give it some thought. You know, if you create a plan, that doesn't mean you're going to fail or you, you know, you're going to succeed. But give it some thought because what you see is kind of like the iceberg theory. You see the iceberg and then under that is all the sleepless nights and where's the revenue going to come from because it's not easy. Yes. And I think I think when we glorify, glorify entrepreneurs, it makes everybody want that version of it, the future state of it, but they don't feel they don't know the current state to get to that point. Can you yes. that? Yes, and I think I think you're right about glorifying and romanticizing things. I mean, don't we do that with so many things? Yeah. And I think uh, you know, I, I push back very strongly against a single answer and a single definition of fulfillment. So, for example, I spent a lot of time in my career working for not-for-profits, so in the NGO charity sector. And then when I worked in a corporate environment or in, a, in the public sector at our central bank, you know, there's this undercurrent, this underlying assumption that, oh, well, it's only people who work in not-for-profits that are really living a fulfilled life or, mm, or truly yeah. delivering against yeah. their purpose. To which I would say, Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Okay. You can find meaning and purpose and fulfillment that works for you and suits you in any environment. Mm -hmm. This this myth, which is so prevalent and so dangerous, of you sell your soul if you go into a corporate and, and there's nothing yeah. there because you're just a cog in the machine. Well, of yeah. course, that can be true. And heaven forbid you in one of those corporates. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I have had some, some incredible experiences in all manner of roles that I've had, of people not just being given a purpose, but creating it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, at this point in my life, working for myself is exactly what I need to do, want to do, and therefore I'm doing it and, and loving it. Yeah. But it's not the answer for everyone, and it needn't be. You can find and create that purpose wherever you are. And, and thinking that just because you're not an entrepreneur or just because you're not working for an NGO, that you can't is, is lazy. It's a cop out and it's simply not true. Mm. So my, my job tenure, um, I, the two longest jobs I had, one was at IBM and I was there for like nine to 10 years and I was Martha Stewart living doing the formative years and I was there for about 10 years. When I looked back over those two and I said, I probably would have stayed at IBM if that business unit would not have had declining earnings and they were going to lay everybody off and I had to switch up and I landed at Martha Stewart. And I probably would have stayed there, but she, as you know that story, she went to jail and by the time she came back, it was shattered. It, it was shattered and we were trying to rebuild everything. Mm. But for the most part, you know, I enjoyed that job. And if those jobs would have, worked, I'm gonna say worked out, if the culture hadn't shifted, I probably would have still been there. Yes, yes. And I, you know, I gave a, a talk the other day to a group of bankers. Um, and I shared a story that I heard when I was heading up leadership and culture for the Standard Bank Group, which is the largest bank by assets in Africa. So I was working across about 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. And I was working, uh, I was doing a lot of interviews across all of the countries to just understand what is the culture of this group. And I had an interview the one Friday afternoon with a, a woman who was heading up repossessions. I mean, there's a technical term. I can't remember what it is for the moment. But essentially her department if you fell behind on your mortgage or your car repayments, they would repossess yeah. your house or your car. <laughs> oh. So I looked at this, I thought, Ugh, it's been a long week um, of fascinating interviews, but you're kidding me. Four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, I've got to interview somebody about this job. Anyway, Ron, so I walk in there and this woman was radiating energy. I mean, she was so fabulous. 
And so I said to him, so nice to meet you. And I have to tell you, your energy is palpable. How on earth do you keep it up? So she said to me, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you've got a really difficult job. So she said, well, what do you mean? So now I'm thinking, well, what do you mean? What do I mean? I mean, you repossess people's homes and cars. And so I said as much to her. And she looked at me and she said, no, but that's not what I do. So now, you know, at this point, I'm completely confused. I said, I beg your pardon. She said, no, that's not what I do. She said, my team and I, what we do every day is we come into this bank to stop people killing themselves. To stop people killing themselves. To stop children becoming homeless. To stop people getting divorced. That's what we come to work to do. You know, and I looked at her and I thought, you have got to be joking. Um, that's nowhere in her KPIs. That's nowhere in her job description. She found and lived and radiated that purpose in the basement of a building, doing something that on paper and even in conversation would be incredibly difficult. There was something bigger for it, bigger than that for her. And I suddenly thought, this is very interesting. Mm. So yeah, purpose is being talked about. Leadership is being talked about in the new era. How can a company instill purpose? So, because you said that wasn't in her job description, but the job she had, she was able to take a, take a look at it from 180 different 180 degrees. I'm not repossessing. I'm not doing that. I'm helping people to try and get out of a situation. How can an organization guide a purpose? Because post COVID, you're going to need that. How can mm. how can how can an organization guide or begin the process of trying to build a purpose around what we do and not just the P&L and making those numbers, which we'd still have to make, I mean. Yeah. You know, I think this is such a, a critical topic and such a, such a huge discussion, but I suppose I've got two thoughts, and they're simply thoughts. I mean, I put up a post two or three days ago saying any time that somebody tells me that the purpose of a company is to make money, I reply with saying, well, that's like saying that the purpose of life is to breathe. You know, well, of course, we've got to breathe to stay alive. Money, you know, organizations, even not for profits, of course, you've got to have money to survive. But if that's it, like I'm going to spend the rest of my life just breathing. Being alive, Making money is not the same thing as fulfilling a purpose and leaving the world better off for having had you or your company in it. And so a lot of conversation on LinkedIn around what this is and what this could mean. But I think this comparison of you know, like saying that the purpose of life is to breathe yeah. is essentially what, what this is about. Money has instrumental value, not intrinsic value. And I think especially with some of the crises in the world, environmentally, politically, socially, Hopefully that is starting to become more apparent. I mean, the focus on ESG for companies. Mm. On the one hand, I think it's fantastic. On the other hand, I'm really worried that it's just been reduced to an acronym and abdicated and outsourced to a department. Oh, we're taking care of the stuff because they're looking at it. As opposed to we're looking at it as the entire company and as human beings whose, whose future on this planet is under severe threat. Mm -hmm. That's my one thought. I think my second thought is, and, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, open to being challenged on this. But in my experience, you can't give people purpose. So in my experience, you can find people who want to have a purpose and you can help them figure it out. Mm -hmm. You can work with people who have forgotten their purpose and you can rekindle it and bring it back to life. But you can't, you can't make that happen for people. Mm -hmm. They need to choose to want to find that yeah themselves mm -hmm. and i think for me especially cynics people who are disengaged and disillusioned and, and have checked out of organizations <laughs> yeah sometimes people wear that that bad that, that cynicism like a badge of honor mm -hmm. and i remember saying to somebody once when he said this to me like i've seen so many changes this place uh, i just sit here and i survive and i wait for the next ceo to come in with the next bunch of changes but nothing ever changes mm -hmm. he said i'm so cynical and he was a man in his 50s, and I looked at him and I said, you know, in my experience, cynics are just disillusioned idealists. 
And Ron, as I said this to him, and I don't know where that came from. I'd never thought of it before. Yeah. As I said that to him, the tears came straight into his eyes. And I thought, yeah, I've hit a nerve here because mm. it's much easier to have the carapace of cynicism to protect yourself when you give a damn yeah. and you care deeply, but, but you feel it's not safe or worth it anymore. And so mm. I think there are a lot of people who care deeply. You can bring them back to life. You can nurture that. But people who are going through life on autopilot, you can't make them care about things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't make them. But it's interesting, an offhanded comment in replying to him and that nerve, you touched it. And the tears came about, you know, as a result of that. And I think lots of times when we, when we have people that want to do certain things, either they're listening to someone else, guiding them, and all of these factors are coming in. So we talk about the inner voice, well, as the outer voice, as the friends, as the family. And I, I've often said, I think universities should spend more time talking to these kinds of things because I, I teach a course here in Dubai, American University, and I, I tell them that to give deep thought as to where you are, where you want to go. And, and, and because the dream job you may have may turn out to not be that dream job. So you're always kind of reflecting on what's happened, what's happening or what happened. Mm -hmm. How can I make adjustments for the following week? Richard, yeah. Branson, Richard Branson mentions a point, and then I'll turn it back to you. Richard Branson mentions a point that I concentrate on my people because if I concentrate and connect with them, they will in turn take care of the customer. So it's kind of mm -hmm. backwards and it used to be the shareholders, customers and employees were less. Yes. So I think it, as you speak, Ron, you were reminding me of that wonderful article by the equally wonderful Clayton Christensen from Harvard Business School. I mean, lit literally and metaphorically a giant where he speaks about how will you measure your life? I actually sent it to somebody just yesterday again. I mean, it is the most moving article and very unequivocal about what matters and what doesn't. And I recommend it to anybody who's listening who hasn't read it because it is very, very profound. Mm. And, and I've just gone blank on the second thing I wanted to say um, because <laughs> I was so busy, so busy thinking the, about Christians. Welcome, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. <laughs> After all the time. <laughs> well, if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll yeah. mention it. Yeah. Well, you know, getting back to that point is when I talk to people, I said, reflect. And I think COVID, I go back to COVID, the anchor of COVID caused people to reflect. Mm. And when I do leadership development, one of the things we talk about is that reflect either on Friday or the previous week. Reflect after the bad meeting. Reflect after the good call to see mm. how, how we can get better at what we do. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, my, a friend of mine has got a lovely way of putting it. She says, we need to have rituals that close off our day, close off our week, close off our month, close off our year. So at the end of every day, she sits and has a whiskey with her husband. And she says, that's like <laughs> a full stop at the end of a sentence. Yes. Every week, she sits in, and has a, a bottle of wine with her husband and her daughters, and they mm. reflect on the week. I mean, you can see where South African alcohol features strongly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She said, you know, her Fridays, well, that's like the end of a paragraph. Yeah. Then at the end of the month, she sits with her team, and they reflect on what's worked and what's not worked. And she mm. said, that's like mm. the end of a chapter. Mm. And then you do something similarly to just stop and review at the end of the year, and that's like the end of a book. And I think, you know, we, we are so caught up in the, the franticness and the busyness and the just trying to keep our head above the water and clear the inbox, i.e. Yeah. achieve the impossible, <laughs> yeah. that to just stop and pause and acknowledge those full stops, those paragraphs, those chapters and those books that make mm. up our life. Mm. I think just doing that is in and of itself a gift. And then what you can take out of it is, of course, an extra gift. You, you, my metaphor for that is an athlete. They practice every day. Yeah. They they go back into the gym or whatever it is, and they do that every day. You find yes. people that say, I want to lose weight, get in better shape, and they do it once a week. So you're not reflecting on the issue that you said you wanted to do. And, and it's the same thing. So you, in order to, to keep the mind fertile, that reflection point is important to have, at least from my vantage point. And you kind of always are in, you're always a kind of in that loop of reviewing things and 
trying to figure out how do I do it better next time around. Yes. So I suppose to loop back to what we were talking about earlier, the idea of, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living. Well, by the same token, an unlived life is not worth examining. I mean, these things are both true. I, I'm going to have to go back to the recording because you're just laying these nuggets out. And I'm, like, oh, <laughs> I'm looking at my note page now and I said, I don't, I, I forget that word, but I'll go back to it to try it, to, to try it, try and uh, understand that. So when you, when you, your leadership development programs, how do you, do you structure those? Walk us through, because I know you do a lot of work in leadership development. Does the topics that we're talking about kind of play into that group that you at that two day retreat or whatever it is? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think giving people space and time and opportunity to reflect and think deeply about their life, I think that really matters. And I think increasingly as I've become more versed in the reality and organize reality of organizations and the reality of power in organizations, I've taken a very strong leaf out of Jeffrey Pfeffer at, gradu at Stanford's Graduate School of Business's book. So he's got a fabulous book called Leadership BS, where he says, you know, a lot of leadership <laughs> development programs are very inspirational, are very aspirational, are very normative, you know, rah, rah, rah. And, and, and there's a place for that. And frankly, we all want that. Just tell us the wonderful stories that make us feel yeah, good. Yeah. But actually, somewhere between the inspirational and the in completely cynical and checked out, well, there's the space of the pragmatic and the empirical. Mm -hmm. And so increasingly in leadership programs, particularly with the work that I do on office politics and power, it's about saying, how do organizations actually work? And there are some organizational facts of life that we are very seldom told and, and very often don't want to hear because it doesn't feel so great. Yeah. And, and the reality is that organizations are not democracies. They are power structures. Who's got the most power wins. And that use and abuse of power does not have to be toxic and negative and Machiavellian. Mm, it can be mm. perfectly ethical and legitimate. And that's why I wrote my book. But there are some realities of life and realities of power in structures and in organizations that increasingly in leadership development, I, I focus on. Because like I say, the, the purely um, kind of hot, stirring, rah-rah, aspirational, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. It doesn't actually re relate and respond to the reality of organizations. And I'm not a cynic, but I am pragmatic. Yeah. yeah. I read an article and they talked about the amount of money spent on leadership development. Yes. Huge, yes. huge number. They said if that was the case, you wouldn't find organizations suffering from, you know, turnover, culture, and all these things. So somewhere along the line, there's something that's totally disconnected because we're investing yes. all of this money to get people better at doing what they do, and then they get back and they don't do that, and it just multiplies. Yes. No ROI. No, no, I, I, I violently agree. This is a, a very heated <laughs> conversation for me. <laughs> so let's take a break now. We we'll come back. I want to talk about toxicity, workplace culture, uh, but your, your, your recent book. Fabulous. Okay, cool. help you elevate your team. Email us at info at strategyfocusedgroup.com. Welcome back. Your, your book, 
if you don't do politics, politics will do you. Mm. After you're talking about a catchphrase, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, excuse me, and of course, the subtitle is a guide to doing politics ethically and successfully. Yes. And yes, it is possible. Yes. So, yeah, I try to cover all of those things. So, walk us through that. So, where did the inspiration for that book come from? Yeah, so Ron, COVID, as with so many people, okay. I had spoken to a publisher and they were very keen to have the book. Um, but then it suddenly got pushed up because I don't know about your diary, but my f diary for the first three months of COVID was like a wasteland. You know, there were tumbleweeds blowing through it and not much else. And so suddenly I had three months to, to write this book. And where it came from was I'd been lecturing on the subject of office politics for about two or three years and realized a number of things. First of all, how prevalent some of the myths of office politics are mm -hmm. and that they're as widespread as they are wrong, but as, as universal as they are naive. And so actually having a course where I spoke people through, first of all, what politics are, and most of us don't understand what they actually are. Certainly I didn't for all of my career. Why they matter how you are never going to escape them, yeah. and then how to develop both the will and the skill to get smarter on them, to really develop your political in intelligence, develop your political muscle, whichever part of your body you want to use as an example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then how to craft a political strategy in the way that you would craft any other strategy for yourself mm -hmm. or for a client. And in the lectures and in sharing some of the frameworks that if I had known in my career would have helped me, but then also talking about some of my experiences, particularly the difficult experiences. And my first executive position was when I was 29. And so I've only really for most of my career, for all of my career, had senior executive positions. Mm -hmm. And yet what I always say to people is I'm now into my fourth degree. I've gone through all kinds of management development <laughs> and training. So I have been taught a lot, and yet the stuff around power and politics was something I had to learn. And yeah. I had to learn it the hard way because it's not something that's spoken about easily or often because it's seen only to be one thing, and that is toxic and Machiavellian and to be avoided at all costs. Yes. And, and that's, yes. it's absolutely part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Mm. And so in understanding that in the lectures and in hearing people's stories, it just felt for me like the most wonderful opportunity to take some of my learnings, some of the frameworks, some of the stories that people had shared and get those out to an audience wider than I could ever meet in person through workshops mm. and lectures and seminars. That's amazing. Um, so how does that work in a virtual environment? Because, you know, we have Teams, we have Zoom, we have all these kinds of things, and maybe we're not in the office as much as we used to be. But it still goes on, and a it, just, it just took on, a, I'm going to say, a different suit of armor. Oh, uh, absolutely. In a, in a virtual environment. No, absolutely. Look, interestingly, at the start of COVID, a lot of people were saying, and it makes sense at face value, oh, well, isn't this going to be fabulous? I don't have to deal with the traffic. <laughs> I can roll out of bed two minutes before the meeting. I don't even have to brush my hair, and I can be on a work call. <laughs> yeah. And, well, how wonderful. I'm not going to have to deal with this politics because I'm not in the office. It goes away. <laughs> And, you know, just as, as I have found, as the research has found, as delegates that I've spoken to have found, that's simply not the case. In yeah. fact, if you define office politics in the way that I do, which is it's the range of informal things that happen in an organization, yes. yeah. the range of informal building of relationships, of crafting a reputation, of increasing your power, of extending your influence to get things done, and what I always say is, look, organizations and teams have got two elements to them. Always, always, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, uh, functional or dysfunctional. They've got the formal side, which is seen and written down and codified. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they've got the informal side, which is where the political stuff happens. Yeah. And you can choose not to get involved in the informal side. But frankly, that's like playing tennis on half the court. You know, soccer on half the field. Because yeah. that is as much a reality of organizations as the formal. And so certainly through COVID, through lockdown, people have said to me repeatedly, no, this stuff has become even more intense yes. because it's happening 
It needs to happen. Decisions around budgets, around priorities, around secondments, around retrenchments, around promotions, all these things are still happening. And yet you're not necessarily seeing them and seeing the people who are making those decisions mm -hmm. every day. And so people are having to be a lot more intentional and a lot more deliberate and focused about how they build up their power, their influence, their reputation, uh, and their network. Yeah, COVID has, has brought it to fruition because one of the things you mentioned, subliminal kind of signals that are being sent off, you know, it, on these virtual kind of a call environment that we're in today. And um, how do you navigate, how do you navigate that? And I think the, the topic of the topic of your book basically brought it into play because you, you're going to have to learn to navigate leadership. And I don't yes. always mean just a C-suite that could be your supervisor and yes. the group of supervisors or on that team that you're working with, understanding each individual. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, a hundred percent. So I think the first thing um, that I always say is when I talk about politics and what they are, and more importantly, what they're not only, i.e. not only toxic and Machiavellian, that in and of itself is a massive paradigm shift for pretty much anyone and everyone I've ever lectured to. And so the first step to get smarter around this stuff is that awareness of what are we actually talking about here? Yeah. And not to just have the single narrow story of it's that revolting stuff and I can either play it or I can be a good person. No, no, no. You can have a both and here. So that, like I say, it's the range of things. So that awareness, I think, is very important as a first step. The second step is then to assess yourself. So on my website, I've got a free workbook using exercises that I've gathered from all over where people can start to assess themselves. Hmm. Okay, so okay. when it comes to some of these dimensions of power and reputation and influence and relationships. You know, how am I stacking up? Mm. And then the, the last section in that workbook is around, okay, well, given the context, and it's always contextual, the context of where I am, the people I'm around, uh, the history, the relationships, and where I want to be, well, what's my political strategy going to be? And how do I start getting deliberate and focused mm. around that? So I think those three elements, awareness, of the importance that you're never going to escape it, that it makes a big difference, that you can do this ethically. Then assessing yourself and how am I stacking up relative to how I want to stack up or should stack up. And then thirdly, action. Okay, well, now what am I going to do about it? And all of these things are about, you know, the basic interpersonal skills yeah. that we get taught. Negotiation, understanding all behavior has a purpose, managing your stakeholders, not as an afterthought, but as a key part of your job. Etc. Mm -hmm. Etc. Et Key part of that strategy. In, in, in so one of the, the metaphors I use is that the antenna is always up, and you yes. picking up you picking up signals. And for I have two kids, and each one of those are different personality. My daughter's one way, my son is a different way. I, the conversation I have with him is totally different than the conversation I have with her. And yes. for someone that's leading people, if you Managing 10 people, that's 10 different conversations that could be. But just Absolutely. be aware of that. And it's not a one size fit all. And this is the directive. We're going to do this. And you've got 90%. Nope, not going to work. Yeah. Well, 100%. I mean, my, I say to people often, I'm sure your parents taught you, Ron, what my parents taught me, which is treat other people the way you would like to be treated. Yeah. And at face value, it's, of course, absolutely right and sensible. Yeah. But in fact, you know, we need to treat people the way they want to be treated. Exactly. And, and what we can't always, we can't always meet their conditions or their demands or their preferences, but taking the time and the trouble and having the curiosity and the empathy to try to understand what the world looks like from their perspective mm. and how they need and want to be treated in that. Well, that's already um, almost 100% more effort than many people put in. Yes, it is. It is. One of the comments, uh, uh, Drew Carmichael asked about great advice and discussion. This will be uh, reposted on, on across uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and all the other social channels. And Marvin Keys Morris, great title and so true. And thank you both for being a guest. Um, this navigation piece. So I was looking at a I, on a competency of, uh, and this is for a senior level human resources person, human resources. Mm -hmm. And one of the competencies out of the nine that stuck out to me was leadership navigation. So you'll talk about business acumen, you talk about all the other stuff, and yeah, we're going to do all this stuff. 
But if you don't do the leadership navigation, if you don't navigate and understand and read from various factors and, and tie that in and try and manage that change you're trying to drive or that project yes. you're trying to, and this is why that's important. Absolutely. And especially the more senior you get, because as I often say to in, uh, emerging, rising leaders, look, the more senior you get, the more people take technical competence for granted, mm -hmm. first of all. And second of all, the more that the people below you should be doing the technical work. Your role is to navigate the landscape. Yes. There are finite resources and infinite demands on those resources. Mm -hmm. There's multiple priorities and perspectives and agendas, and many of them are competing and conflicting. And how are you going to navigate that to best understand where things are going and how you can position yourself and your priorities and those of your team? Okay, mm -hmm. look, this is not just about you. If it is just about you at the expense of other people and at the expense of the organization, well, then you're a sociopath. Mm -hmm. But this is always ideally about an intention and a purpose that's bigger than you, a group of people that are relying on you that is bigger than you, and giving them, and by extension then yourself, the best chance of success. Mm. I, I talk about the Friday to Monday transition, and the, and the metaphor I use with that, if I'm the accountant of a group of accountants, and I get promoted to be the accounting supervisor, when I come in on Monday morning, the skill I had from the prior, it's totally different yes. because now I'm managing people and not mm. so much doing the technical side of it. So the soft side is going to be key, yes. you know, and leaders of the so-called future of post COVID. Do you agree? I would completely agree. And of course um, I would add to what you're saying, the leading people and managing people is not just downwards. It's laterally and upwards and across divisions as well. Yeah. And that's where the political skill comes in because you're not formally managing. They don't have reporting power, but you're managing the landscape to, as I said earlier, give yourself and your team the best chance of success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's next? What are you working on now that's exciting that has you uh, looking towards that so-called Monday? Well, gosh, there's a couple of things. I suppose the two that immediately come to my, well, three. I'm working on a, a new book, uh, which is oh. a lot of fun. Uh, and requires a lot of travel, and and um, that was planned. The okay. second thing is I've I'm about four months, five months into my PhD, which means I've still got three and a half years to go. Wow! But, you know, it's one of those things in life that I get to do. I don't got to do. Yeah. None of my clients care about this. I care about this. I'm intensely yeah. interested in the topic, and guess what? I get to do it. So mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying that. Uh, and then the third thing is I'm having an enormous birthday party for a weekend in August for my 50th. And some of my, most of my favorite people from all over the world are coming for two days. Oh, wow. That's be be cool. for South Africa. So it is going to be an absolute um, ball. And I think even more so after COVID, you know, to celebrate life and love and friendships and the mm. beauty of beautiful places is no the, small the, thing. The important things. The important yes. things. Yes. yes. So I want to tell the audience again, uh, I want you to Google the article, How Fear Stopped Me From Betting on Myself. Great article, great visual storytelling as opposed to 1,200, 1,500 words. And the name of that book uh, is If You Don't Do Politics, Politics Will Do You. I, and that is my, on my to-do list. And I'm going to, is it on audible.com? Because I tend no, to No, it's not audible. on Audible, but it uh, is on okay. Amazon. Um, and I did write an article about it for Harvard Business Review as well. So it's called You Can't Sit Out of His Politics. Ooh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, you know what? I thank you so much for being a guest and, and the time differences because you're, you're, you're logging in from uh, South Africa. Um, but I really appreciate the time that you, you've spent with me over the past week or so in the topics and, and, and giving, giving us the time to have this conversation. So thank you no, so much. No, thank you for the invitation. It was a lovely way to end my week. Yes. Uh, I want you to hang on for a second as we close out. 